So um, this is a panel, we're looking specifically at well-being in anti-racist practice in the heritage sector. And we've got three really great speakers. Sorry to big you up, but Drew. <laughs> um, and um, we're just going to go through. So first we'll have uh, Melina Valdiev, who works with Education Scotland. Um, and she's going to be looking to speak more about racial trauma um, and also about the Building Racial Literacy programme that she's worked on through Education Scotland. And then Lisa Williams, um, who is an honorary fellow um, at the University of Edinburgh and um, has the Black History Walks in Edinburgh. She will also be, she'll be looking specifically at research um, and um, the, the black experience in research and, and kind of talking more to that experience. Um, and then um, Kinrin Fowler, um, who's a professor at University of Leicester, will be talking um, a little bit about her experience working within organisations and the organisational leads when it comes to looking at um, anti-racist work and, um, and the support that you potentially that you need. So those are the three. Um, and so, yeah, so as a, um, just to introduce myself as well, um, my name is Sheila Asante and I work with the Museums Gallery Scotland, um, um, but my, main, my role is to project manager for Empire Slavery and Scotland's Museums Project. Um, and that project if you don't, haven't already heard the blurb, um, it's, was in, the inception for that project came in July 2020. Um, and there was um, a statement in Parliament in support of a museum of slavery on the back of a lot of the work um, and activism um, across um, the equalities and third sector. Um, there was this the statement in Parliament in support of a museum of slavery for Scotland. Um, that was then put into the programme for government for the Scottish government, broadened out to looking at the, the museum proposal itself, but also as how all of museums um, and galleries would be addressing the legacies of empire, colonialism and historic slavery across the sector. Um, and then through that project, um, there was an independent steering group and uh, Lisa Williams is on our steering group. Um, and they were put in place um, in December 2020 to make the recommendations um, to the Scottish Government on how to address these legacies. And um, we will be doing that shortly. Those recommendations will be coming out in uh, mid-June and going to Scottish Government. Um, and they'll be there for the, for the whole sector to see, um, to, look, to, to kind of start moving this work forward. Um, and so, yeah, that's th this project and a lot of the, the things that um, the speakers will be talking about have been brought up throughout the work that we've done in our consultation for this project and um, through also just the people we've worked with. And it's been really key, key and interesting, well, interesting and sad sometimes to see the effect of doing this anti-racist work on being able to actually sustain that and also do the work um, stay within the sector and we have over the course of the project actually lost three different people from a different areas within the this the consultation program to um not for different reasons but there's elements of the the work being really not that easy to be able to also do that and um and maintain your own well-being so um but yes yeah, so one of the reasons why we wanted to to kind of bring this up as well um so yeah so just to start with um melina as I say, she works currently with Education Scotland um, um, and she's a trained teacher and she's the co-founder of the Anti-Racist Educator, which, if you don't know, is a Scottish collective working towards um, an education system that is free from racial injustice and critically engaged with um, issues of identity, privilege and power. Um, and, yeah, she's um, really going to be speaking a bit about the work that she's been doing with um, Education Scotland. So I'll just pass her. Thank you, Sheila, for the introduction. I hope you can all hear me. Fine. Can I ask you to mute while I speak because there's a bit of feedback and then I'll get started. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm really delighted to be joining um, a hybrid event, my first experience, so I'm really excited about this. Um, and as Sheila introduced me, my name is Melina Vedeliev, um, and I'm the program lead for the Building Racial Literacy Program. Um, so my background was really helped me shape this program. 
Um, I was an English teacher before that, involved in a lot of anti-racist research, um, looking at racial dialogue, how do we talk about racism in education with young people, with children, with staff, and it's, it's obviously race is a very contentious issue, it is also very emotional. So the Building Racial Literacy Programme is a three-month programme that um, I designed with lots of different partners, co-created it, and the design partners and I got together and thought about how we really best engage um, educators in building their racial literacy, so really engaging in deeper anti-racist learning, anti-racist action through their curriculum. And one of the most important things for us when we were considering this program that was going to be um, offered to Scottish edu well, educators in Scotland across all the different Scottish local authorities. We wanted to make sure that we were both including um, and catering to the needs um, of Black, Asian and minority ethnic educators. There aren't that many in Scotland, only 1.8% um, in the teaching profession compared to 4% or even 11% the, the in the general population. And we wanted to make sure that white educators were able to engage with the program content and not be pushed back or to, um, to not struggle too, too much with the difficult emotions that come up when we learn about anti-racism. So one of the key concepts, um, the design partners of the program and myself considered throughout the process was um, racial trauma. Now, I've done a bit of research on this um, informally, and um, I would definitely recommend Ghislaine Kinyuani's book, um, Living While Black, where she really, um, so she's a black um, psychologist based in the UK, and she really has done fantastic work on racial trauma, especially in the workplace. And um, when we talk about racial trauma, the term was first coined by Robert Carter, and it's really used to describe the physical and psychological symptoms that people of color often experience after exposure to particularly stressful experiences of racism. And so similar to post-traumatic syndrome, um, you, you, you can experience very similar symptoms of depression, anxiety, um, so recurring events, images in your mind. Um, and actually the difference is that you can experience trauma as a result of multiple events adding up. And so you might just be learning about racism, you might be learning about something that um, you are teaching in the classroom, for example, and that can affect your health and well-being, that can trigger racial trauma. So racial trauma is different in, in compared to other types of trauma because it is continuous and cumulative for people of color. You, a person of color will experience racism most likely throughout their lives, and the more you experience it, the less your thresholds um, the less you'll have the threshold for those experiences. And that's where you can experience a sort of crisis and that's where you can experience racial trauma um, symptoms that I mentioned and more. So it can, has, it can have well-being, mental well-being um, impacts, but also physical well-being um, impacts. It is also very subjective, one event that is particularly stressful um, racially stressful can affect different people differently. So just because one racist incident didn't harm one person doesn't mean it's not harmful for everyone else. Um, it really depends on individuals' experiences, how much of a uh, social network and support they have to cope with those different experiences. And racial trauma is also collective. And um, one example of that would be um, the 2020 murder of George Floyd. That was a collective um, well, an individual incident that was experienced collectively by Black people across the world as something that reminded um, everyone that black, pe black lives are not really valued in society. They're not taken care of. And that can be experienced as racially traumatic for anyone viewing that event, even just the video. Um, and so that is an example of how it's, it's really globally collective and subjective, it affects people differently. It's also a historical uh, phenomenon because we have, when we're looking at racism, we're also looking at the legacies of colonialism, we're looking at um, injustices that um, have not been dealt with, that um, have not been given time to, to heal for different communities who experience colon colonialism and slavery. And it is also intergenerational. There's a symptom, um, 
a phenomenon called post-slavery um, uh, traumatic syndrome. And that's uh, an American psychologist that researched the descendants of um, enslaved people in the US and how they were, they were passing on different ways of coping with um, stress and slavery. And those, those, those coping mechanisms are definitely not helpful today. So it is um, something that is experienced differently across lots of different groups of people, lots of different communities, but it is um, something we should be really mindful of when we're thinking about talking about race, learning about racism, and um, just looking at content that um, exposes different racial injustices. So with that in mind, we um, were designing different, uh, when we were looking at the Building Racial Literacy Program, we were looking at the trend content um, of the program and racial microaggressions were an important aspect, um, piece of content to consider in the Building Racial Literacy Program because my, racial microaggressions can add up and trigger racial trauma. So just one small incident might seem small, can actually trigger um, a crisis of racial trauma for a young person, for an educator. And so it's helpful to just think about the definition of racial um, microaggressions. It can be brief, common, daily verbal behavioral indignities. It can be unintentional or intentional. And it usually communicates hostile um, and negative racial slights and insults towards people of color. And similarly, you've got micro invalidations where um, you are communicating something that negates or nullifies a person's thoughts, feelings, or their experience of reality. So even anything as simple as the question, where do you come from, might trigger uh, what might be experienced as a racial microaggression if it's questioning that person's sense of belonging in Scotland, for example, if they're a person of color, and that can easily trigger racial trauma. So with that context of racial trauma, racial microaggressions, we really wanted to make sure that participants of color on the Building Racial Literacy Program did not experience racial trauma or were less likely to experience racial trauma. Um, so it was really important for us to create uh, a framework and a structure in the program where we were giving participants the tools to really make sense of their experiences, their emotional experiences. So we created um, different program principles, so creating safer, braver learning spaces. Um, and we really reinforce those principles throughout the, pro the three month program. So the first principle gets participants to think about acknowledging their emotions, trying to make sense of why they're feeling that way. Um, and it's really important for um, white majority ethnic people to also question their, those emotions and um, acknowledge those emotions and also start thinking about why those emotions are coming up whenever we're looking at different racial issues, embracing productive discomfort. So discomfort is always important when you're learning, but especially so when we're looking at uncomfortable topics such as racism. Um, and for people of color, when that discomfort becomes too much for potentially because of racial trauma, it becomes distress. That's where we ask people to step back and think about think about committing to self care. So one of the first activities we did during the program was getting everyone to identify what sort of self care activities they could identify. What were their strategies in general life, and always go back to those strategies and activities that help them deal with any emotional content of the program. Um, another two principles that are really important: building relationships. Um, when we're learning together in a space, it's really important to go in when, uh, in a way that is empathetic and compassionate. We often told participants we're not going in the program, trying to point fingers at each other and tell each other that we're terrible people for something we did or thought in the past. We're all here to learn together and help each other grow. And embracing that capacity to grow is really um, liberating for individuals who think that actually they're they don't know how to talk about racism or they're not confident, so they just don't talk. But actually, if you understand that in order to grow and learn, you need to make mistakes, you need to practice, you adopt a growth mindset, then you can overcome some of the challenges when it comes to um, anti-racism. And viewing that capacity for growth in others is also liberating because you can see that they will also have a chance to grow if you give them the right space, the right tools to do so.
Um, and so I share there on the slide a quotation that um, I got from uh, an academic in the US where she says that actually race is an emotional topic and it's so important to create spaces where this emotion can exist. Um, too often we stifle and encourage people to be stoic about racism in, in education, but also uh, you, as you could argue in the museum sector. Um, we try to make it an intellectual exercise, but what, what we really need is students and adults to feel the emotions in their heart, not just process things in their brains in order to create um, motivation for change, to inspire people to change. And that's really important um, in your well-being as well. There's no point engaging in anti-racism if it's just going to be draining. If you don't see a way forward, you need to be inspired and motivated to change. Another structure we implemented in the program, the Building Racial Literacy Program, was uh, creating different affinity spaces. So we had three different affinity spaces for each participant based on their role in education. So to address any power imbalances, if we had a head teacher, for example, um, they would be with people in similar roles and then classroom teachers with people in similar roles. We also had people um, put together in regions to support, uh, uh, find support networks that are closer to them. But most importantly, we also had affinity spaces based on their racial identities. So majority ethnic people, white people would be together um, in, in separate groups. And then people of color, black, Asian, minority ethnic people had their own spaces as well to really um, maximize their learning and feel safe. But we also had those mixed spaces to really um, develop their anti-racist um, skills. And finally, the last thing we put in place to support anyone who struggled with their um, experiences of racial trauma throughout the program, if anything came up, if anything was triggered, or even for our participants, if it became too much emotionally, we had what we called compassion captains who were essentially counselors attending all program events and who were there to support anyone who needed um, to talk about their, their, their emotional experiences during the program. And so here are a few quotations from participants where they essentially say that um, the compassion captains, the safer spaces really benefited their learning. It really benefited um, their ability to move forward and feel inspired throughout the program. And I'll stop right here because I think I've been uh, speaking for a bit too long. So thank you very much for listening. So yeah, um, Lisa Williams uh, is the founder of the Edinburgh Caribbean Association um, and she cur curates education programmes, arts events and walking tours um, to promote the shared heritage between Scotland and the Caribbean and the possibilities of decolonising practice. And she's, as I mentioned before, an honorary fellow um, in the School of History, Classics and Archaeology at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and works as a consultant to heritage organisations across Scotland. And she's worked with um, National Trust, National Museums, um, uh, Edinburgh Museums, uh, and a whole host of others um, in doing her work. And I will pass to her. Okay, thanks very much, Sheila. And um, yeah, so hi to everybody. I'll try and fit my what I need to say in my few minutes. So there's, there's many areas that I could have addressed today, and I've chosen three. And then if we have time, just a few questions to consider for all of us really to consider going forward with this kind of work. So one of the big issues that comes up quite a bit when I'm working with curators in different museums, maybe art galleries, also learning and outreach folks as well. Um, when examining the decision-making process and curating um, exhibitions that are particularly connected to Scotland's colonial past, sometimes if, that decision-making process hasn't been analysed enough, maybe not brought in enough people, um, maybe done in a way that can still be quite upsetting to people who know those histories in detail from historically affected communities. And one of the things I wanted us to examine perhaps to do, or think about maybe in your own practice, when you're making these decisions, I think most of us have moved away from this idea of museums being neutral, or you know, having that ability to be neutral. Um, but some people holding on to this idea of trying to create some kind of balance when they are perhaps creating a label for a, a sitter in a gallery or a museum or as part of that exhibition. I know it's really tough to do because I've also been involved in actually rewriting and starting to write um, from scratch um, labels in various museums. It's not an easy thing to do. 
Um, but this idea of, of needing to find the good to display, even if it's somebody who perhaps was a colonist or enslaver who's actually inflicted some of the worst cruelty and violence on people. Um, people have been deemed to be subhuman within the colonial context, in the colonial system. And with the proceeds that have accrued to them or the community from that violence, um, wealth as an individual or using that wealth as a benefactor for people racialized as, as white at home. And understanding that this is not a contradiction, but understanding this is built into the system of colonialism, exploiting one area or group of people to benefit um, a person's own in-group. And I think that's something um, would be important for us to, to discuss as, as people involved in this area in Scotland a bit more. Um, so thinking again, I mean, Lena was talking about the emotional impact of the work, thinking about even just working in the archives, particularly with historical research. Um, and for people to understand the impact of doing this kind of work, particularly on um, people from historically affected communities, but honestly, anybody who um, has an open heart and is quite empathetic and quite sensitive and can be very affected by working with some very traumatic material on a regular basis and maybe not having the support as you might do if you were a therapist and you had a supervisor to kind of help you process emotionally those kinds of things. And understanding that if people are working with this material regularly, um, maybe if somebody's got a deadline to create an article um, based around that kind of material, that person may need some recovery time built into that and also time to process the material as you're working with it, particularly if you're trying to, to really take care with it. Now, sometimes this, with the lack of understanding, can turn into, oh, you're being very emotional, you're being quite irrational, quite difficult, um, sort of defective in some way. So these are ideas that, of course, will come from the colonial system. Um, and then also thinking about, if, especially if you've taken an awful lot of care with the historical material, really trying to pay respect to people that have gone through very, um, very, very difficult experiences. And sometimes you may see those stories being used or talked about in a way that is quite inappropriate. So maybe with some kind of inappropriate humour, maybe it's, it's the details of the violence is a little bit gratuitous. And these are areas where I think sometimes people can, can fall into um, quite, quite easily. It's quite a common thing, so it's just something to be aware of. Um, now, also, the... When you're working in the archives with this kind of violence, of course, Melina touched on this as well with her presentation, the knowledge of present day levels of um, racial discrimination, whether that's interpersonal, whether that's structural, um, thinking about how the fact that hate crime is on the rise in Scotland at the moment, and also seeing and talking about and experiences the effects of, of racism on family, friends, community, and also, as Melina touched on, internationally as well particularly at the moment in the UK with the hostile environment and the media, but also sometimes people having to struggle through racist incidents in heritage organisations themselves, whether that's as a visitor, whether that's as, as a staff member. But when we come to thinking about providing care and safety, um, both physically and psychologically, um, particularly thinking about um, if you're engaging practitioners of black people and practitioners of colour, making sure that you're trying to build trust by using, by being as transparent as possible about the processes that um, they're involved in, in the museum, the kinds of conversations that might be being had about their work behind the scenes that they're not aware of, um, and making sure that these conversations are regular and, and ongoing. Um, and this kind of communication is, is very much valued. So sometimes black practitioners are used specifically to be subversive or provocative in a heritage organization. And if that's the case, I mean, that I think we can um, have a lot of conversation around and analyze whether that's even appropriate. But if that's the case, making sure that person has access to public support and also support within the organization itself. Communicating where you intend to share their work is really important, where you have shared their work, maybe without their own knowledge. So that person then knows who has been exposed to their work and their thoughts and those audiences. 
and also how you might have communicated their work to that audience. It might not be in a way that they've done. You need to check in with them to see if they approve of the approach and also whether it's safe for them in the face of any hostility or attacks. What plan have you got in place if anything um, like that happens? Also in person, I'm thinking about online and the kinds of things that you can do to protect people online. The most simple, simplest thing you can do is disable comments potentially on, a, on an online talk, recorded talk or film that may attract some hostility. Um, but also thinking about in, in real life spaces, which of course hopefully we're back to now for good. Um, there have been situations where let's say a young person of color has been engaged to come in, be quite provocative and then facing um, a white middle-class audience. And especially if that, that person is not perceived or welcomed as part of that in-group and basically othered in that situation, thinking about the kinds of protection that they might need in that um, real life space. So what kinds of groups have you might maybe reached out to so that you have an audience that's made up of people from different backgrounds, um, that they're not necessarily facing an audience that are the kinds of audience that would always come into those events and are maybe not used to being um, provoked or, or being faced with um, ideas and concepts that are very, very new to them and they might react to them in a very defensive way. So not just in a defensive way, but sometimes it has happened where people have actually gone on the attack to that particular person, they might have come up to them and been very aggressive and made them feel extremely unwelcome in a very deliberate kind of way. So the kinds of things that you could do to set up security for that person, making sure they've got friends and family around, making sure that maybe they go into a private space after they have performed maybe something very personal, those kinds of things that you can put into place to make that entire experience very comfortable and safe for them. On a more subtle level, but just as important, thinking about whether um, we're engaging with people with heritage, perhaps from um, cultures that are perhaps ex-colonies, where they're connecting to, um, to Scottish history and the kinds of history that is normally or has been um, normally presented in our museums here. Thinking about whether as a museum practitioner, you're expecting that person's cultural worldview. That's really important. So thinking about what has been termed epistemic violence by certain scholars, um, post-colonial scholars like um, Gertrude Spivak and others. And this, this sense of de delegitimizing other people's way of, of knowing. And that's a, whole, that's a classic part of, of domination and part of colonialism. Thinking about how their interpretation of the world might differ from yours, but respecting that. Um, and within that, there's often this, this idea of a refusal to, to understand, which leads to, to a silencing. And how you might break this as an individual, and it could be very simple, small things, like simply recognizing that person, affirming, speaking up, and also asking questions about um, their worldview in creating a kind of work that might be in your, in your organization. Um, the other important thing I think is communicating to that person the effects of their work for change in the museum, particularly if it is a lot of um, emotional labor, make that person quite vulnerable and making sure that that, that person knows the, the positive effects, hopefully, and the change that it's been having in the museum on, on an ongoing basis. Emotional support as a group, um, very, very important. Um, so I like the idea that um, Melina was saying about having a compassion captain and having that person in place in, in certain um, meetings where emotions can, can run quite high. And also making sure like with, we, we're going through um, a collaboration with Museum Galleries Edinburgh at the moment. And we've deliberately brought on a, a therapist, a poetry therapist who, can also work with the group and work through some of those emotions that are, are coming up, um, the difficult emotions about um, life in Scotland and the racism that people face as well. And been very, very effective for release and, and understanding the support as we go through. So just to finish, just thinking about um, throwing out some questions really, knowing that of course, it's really important that we all work together on this, you know, in this work. Um, I like to use the term accomplices rather than, than allies and allyship, 
um, and thinking about how we work together to dismantle um, these legacies of colonialism and also neo-colonialism and these structures of white supremacy that we still um, are living with. So in doing so, asking yourself, and this is for all of us to do as we go forward, am I reinforcing structural disadvantage, access to power and wealth, even if um, not doing it that with intent? If that's the case, if you reflect on it and you think that's the case, how can I mitigate it? Um, so if you are racialized as white, maybe making sure that you reference um, black and brown scholars who may have done the work previously, making sure they're cited. And if you have a platform that's building to make sure that you also open up your platform to um, provide a platform for those people as well. Um, and all of us needing to be aware um, Sometimes if we are selected over other people that are more structurally disadvantaged, that we can be keeping an eye on that as we go forward and making sure that we insist that, that, that people are always included in the way that they should be. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I'm aware that um, Karen's going to need her time to speak and I think we should be just about all right for time. So thank you. There we go, sorry. Uh, Corinne is Professor of Colonialism and Heritage at the University of Leicester and she's author of Green and... Green Unpleasant Land, Creative Responses to Rural England. Um, is colonial, sorry, Rural England's Colonial Connections. Can't read my own writing, sorry. Um, and the forthcoming book, The Countryside, Ten Walks Through Colonial Britain. Um, she co-edited the National Trust report on its country houses connection to empire, an audit um, of peer-reviewed research by historians on its country houses connections to all aspects of colonialism. And she's also director um, of a child-led um, history and writing project called Colonial Countryside, National Trust Houses Reinterpreted. Um, and I will pass to Karen. Yes, I, 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 um, everything that's been said so far has been so wise and insightful. And I just want to add a slightly different dimension from my experience of uh, having co-edited this uh, National Trust report for not the Scottish one, but the one for England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, it received a very adverse reaction from the press for a year. <laughs> um, sometimes multiple articles every week for months. And it was obviously that was a bit of an onslaught. Um, the uh, you may have seen it, you may not have seen it, but government ministers briefed against the National Trust report and um, there were all kinds of terrible articles with no right of reply. It was really, really difficult time. And um, one thing that that taught me, it was a really uh, a masterclass in lots of things. But one of them that it was uh, one of the things that was useful in sight is to understand what a triggering area of history this is. And that an emotional, emotionally intelligent approach is absolutely vital it's triggering because it's traumatic on one side of that history but there is denial and hostility on the other side of that history and um, uncomfortable responses are not always productive if someone then puts the wall up and and sort of tries to block or obstruct the work so I, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what happened to me and, and what I've learned from, from what happened to me and the National Trust in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, but it was a, a really, really sort of overwhelmingly hostile environment, to borrow Lisa's phrase, that we were in. And um, I learned a lot of things, including uh, I gained a, a big understanding into why uh, so many people were triggered in a very hostile way by Daily Mail articles and so on. And one of the things I learned was not merely to spend, it was strategically much more useful to understand that response so that I could reach those people than to judge that response. And it was much more productive uh, for those with privilege, especially to call people in rather than call them out. So for example, I received many hundreds of hate emails uh, every time there was a Daily Mail or Telegraph article. And uh, sometimes I would reply to those, uh, partly as a learning exercise for me. And it, the email would start off with, you know, swearing at me, calling me all kinds of things. But if I replied respectfully, trying to understand how they reached that conclusion, explaining the position, uh, 
sort of uh, reasonably explaining what the rationale was. Uh, usually what would happen was that not only was the person amazed that I responded and responded politely, but they would then ask me a series of questions, which I would then respond to. <laughs> and um, in after about three emails, they were wishing me well. They were either agreeing to disagree or they were saying, oh, well, you know, I hadn't thought about that before. And I think it's really important to understand that there has there have been generations of people in this country subject to miseducation in the sense that there's a 400 year gap in many people's knowledge about the history of empire in this country you know sort of skipping from the Tudors to World War II and uh, maybe industrialization with the colonial bit removed so I think uh, it's been a real lesson in trying to uh, also anticipate how newspapers might spin things. <laughs> so I just wanted to provide one example of the Jane Austen Museum, which decided after Black Lives Matter to um, incorporate the story of slavery and colonialism into this story of Jane Austen, which is there is every justification for um, for multiple reasons that I don't have time to go into now. but. Um, the way in which this is presented is really important because there are ways of doing things that aren't then going to become necessarily, although sometimes there's nothing you can do will prevent it, uh, a bad news story. And so what, what newspapers did immediately was seized on a panel called, you know, J Jane Austen cares, uh, Black Lives Matter to Jane Austen. You know, that's just a perfect panel heading for a Daily Mail, distorted Daily Mail headline. <laughs> um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention, because I know we're very short of time and uh, we can come back to some of these things, is the thing that's been alluded to uh, in much more detail than I ever could with loads of really great suggestions about backroom support. But it's really important to um, make sure that your top level managers and your immediate managers make a pledge that they will not abandon you if things get difficult because no change happens without pain. Uh, it's a bit like childbirth, there's no way through. If, if, if you're going to do something transformational, it's gonna hurt and you need to stand together, you need to have proper support built in. Um, you know, fear, <laughs> fear of getting it wrong is no excuse at all. And, and um, I, I was, uh, I have been reading recently, um, which I find is so interesting to read it in the context of the culture wars, Martin Luther King's sermons, A Gift, a gift of Love, uh, they're collected by Penguin. And um, he describes the culture wars almost exactly, and it does make you realize that this is a long, long struggle, which is nothing new. It just takes on different forms at different places in different times. It's still the kinds of legacy that uh, Lisa was alluding to in her talk. So I'll leave that there and then we'll hopefully have time for questions.